Okay, so let's start talking about economic models here. Um, this is important because often at this point in the semester, we've made it through three sessions. This is session four. Um, you may be terrified slash frustrated slash confused about why we're doing these these models. Why do we even care about game theory and these payoffs and these quadrants? And um, especially in the next, next few sessions, we're going to be talking about indifference curves and budget lines and supply and demand and all of this stuff that are very simplified views of the world. And so why are we even doing this? Why am I making you learn about game theory? Um, some common complaints that I get from students all the time and that I complain about all the time too, is the world is never this simple. Um, so far in all of these games, we're talking about two farmers or just Anil and Vala or just two friends and that's all. But the world is not that, that simple. You have multiple farmers. You have 190 different countries that all have to deal with climate change. It's not just two. Um, and once you get into that kind of dimensionality with just hundreds of different possible actors, it gets really impossible to, to figure out the different payoffs and the game strategies and stuff. And it's just like, you can't do it. And so we're stuck in this world of these two by two matrices. And so why? Um, also, the predictions that you get out of these models are often like super obvious. Um, in the, the restaurant example, where we looked at the Chinese restaurant and the Italian restaurant, um, the outcomes are that these two friends will either go to a Chinese restaurant together or an Italian restaurant together. That seems like a super obvious outcome. Like, duh, they're going to go to the restaurant together. Um, so why are we even doing this? Um, and the reason is that these models, as goofy as they are and as oversimplified as they are, they purposely shrink the world down in a way that, like, to make it so that we can measure it and make predictions in it. Um, with the restaurant example, for instance, you have these two friends. Um, occasionally, they're going to show up at the wrong restaurant and they're going to get negative pay or zero payoffs and it's going to be bad for them. Um, but then next time they'll coordinate and they'll talk with each other and make sure they end up at the right places. Um, and that will happen in real life. But because of game theory, because of how we've made this, this matrix, we can actually predict how often that's going to happen. If you did the, the, mixed, uh, the mixed strategy um, resources that I posted on the course website, or if you tried the extra credit problem set question, um, you can actually get probabilities that they will end up in different squares um, based on the payoffs and stuff. And so even though it seems really super obvious that they're going to go to one of these restaurants together, there is a chance that they won't. And this model helps us see that. Um, all models do this. When you take statistics classes, you're going to be making very simple models looking at the relationship between like two variables. Um, you might have multiple vari or multivariate regression where you can include other control variables um, and control for different confounders. Um, and, and that's good, but there's no way you can measure every single possible thing that influences poverty or influences um, GDP per capita or anything that you're trying to predict um, with regression. It's impossible. Um, there's this apocryphal story that like the only perfect map that is an ideal representation of the entire world has to be the size of the entire world. It has to be a like one inch to one inch representation. And that's the only way you're going to get a perfect map is to basically recreate the entire world. Um, maps purposely shrink down aspects of geography um, into much smaller things. Um, they have all sorts of scales. You can just have like a globe on a desk that has a representation of the world. You can zoom in and just get like a map of downtown Atlanta, and that's going to be fairly accurate, but it's not going to be perfectly accurate. You're not going to see how many cracks there are on the sidewalks or other things like that. So you have to zoom in even more. Um, and so you have different levels of complexity in these models they're all useful. A globe is useful for some things. A globe is not going to give you driving directions between um, two different cities, but it's going to show you the relative position of like Nepal versus Peru. Um, and that's good. And so models have different purposes and they're supposed to be overly simplified. That's the whole point of using them. That's the only way we can understand the world. Um, this former economist from the, the IMF here, um, he has this quote here that says like, no economic model can perfectly describe reality. Again, that would be a map that represents the entire world and it's, it is the world. But the process of constructing and testing and revising models forces economists and policymakers to tighten their views about how an economy works or how an interaction between two people works. And so as you simplify things down, 
that's the only way you're gonna be able to understand them. There's lots of complexity you're throwing away, but you can still get kind of the core principles of the thing you're trying to study. And so what I would argue is that making these models, whether it's a regression model, a supply and demand model, um, a game theory model, any of these things that we're doing, it's, it's useful because it lets us understand not just how an economy works, but how anything works. That's how we understand the world, is by simplifying it down and then using that to understand other situations. Um, a good model, whether it be a statistical model, economic model, a mental model for how something works, any sort of model, um, if it's, it's good, if it's clear, and if it's parsimonious, parsimonious means it just has like the fewest moving parts that make it still understandable. Um, so in a regression model, if you take statistics, for instance, you could include like 10,000 control variables for stuff, but that's unnecessary um, because like, first of all, you'd need a ton of data for that. But second of all, like if you only include like six variables in regression, you're going to get roughly the same answer that you would if you included 10,000 um, because you don't need all of that detail if you're trying to model a specific thing. You can simplify it down and have a good parsimonious, simple model. Um, good models identify important relationships. They make good predictions. That's a good way of measuring how well a model works. And they improve communication. Um, you can um, explain different social phenomena to people using um, statistical models, economic models, game theory models, all of these things. Um, and it makes it easy for people to understand um, the different phenomena that you're trying to measure. And it gets rid of lots of the uncertainty, it gets rid of lots of the variation, and just zooms in on kind of the core aspects of the thing that you care about. And finally, they're useful. It's, it's a way of understanding the world at different levels. Um, like globes are not a not useful thing. They are useful for specific situations. Game theory is overly simplified, yes but it is still useful in specific domain in spe specific domains and so that's what we care about and that's why we're learning about all of these models as weird as it is as awkward it is as it is and time consuming as it is to cover up rows and columns and make circles and dots and do all of the game theory stuff um that is a, w a helpful way of understanding how the world works even if it is oversimplified so that's why we're doing this um, so stick with it and you'll find that there is actually benefit to simplifying things down into useful models and we'll get more practice with that throughout the semester.